Good evening, everybody. That's quite a crowd here, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And then there's the overflow room. And then there's too. the overflow room. Well, welcome, everybody, to the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University, whether you are in the room or whether you are joining us on C-SPAN or Facebook Live or any of our live streaming. Uh, this is um, a great pleasure to have you. I'm Frank Cesno, director of the School of Media and Public Affairs. And this is a place where we connect um, complex, controversial, fascinating issues of the day with uh, those who are shaping them, our students, our faculty, and those who are researching them. I am delighted, positively delighted, to be partnering with Margaret Talev and the White House Correspondents Association for this event. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, Frank, and thank you, everyone, for turning out tonight. We appreciate it so much. I am Margaret Talev. I am president of the White House Correspondents Association. I cover the White House for Bloomberg. I do a little analysis for CNN, and uh, it's just an incredible pleasure and gift to get to spend the time with you guys tonight. Um, the WHCA, for those of you who don't know, uh, represents the White House Press Corps. This is hundreds of uh, journalists, whether they're print or TV, radio, online, uh, photographers who cover the White House day in and day out. And uh, our job is to be a liaison between our press corps and the White House to educate the public, to uh, raise issues about access and make sure we can get as much public information as possible to you, to the public. Um, and uh, we do scholarships, we do awards every year to honor great work, and we champion the First Amendment and this is an important time for their First Amendment. So uh, tonight, we really look forward to be able to bring you the voices of some of the people on the front lines uh, who do this day in and day out, and to be able to take your questions on issues and, and concerns that you care about. And as you may know, and if you don't, you should, we have every year a student who um, has one of these White House Correspondents Association scholarships. Uh, we support that student through his or her four years here, and then he or she caps it off by attending the dinner, getting a president with the president, presuming the president goes to the dinner, uh, and spending time with the, uh, with the correspondents. This conversation here tonight is exceptionally timely and remarkable and fascinating. Uh, I was a White House correspondent myself some years ago. Um, I was a very young correspondent, kindergarten correspondent. I You're like still to say. young now. Yes, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, and I covered the Reagan White House, and I covered the Bush White House, the George Herbert Walker Bush White House, and I've interviewed several presidents. This presidency changes um, what we have seen in many ways. Donald Trump ran as a disruptive president, disruptive candidate, he certainly was, and he's certainly a disruptive president. And some of the challenges to covering uh, the White House, uh, the president's criticisms uh, on uh, the media, on news, what he calls fake news, uh, have also been news and have shaped things as well. So I'm sure we'll touch on that uh, this evening as well. Uh, for us, our work every day really is about doing our jobs day in and day out. Uh, but there are moments in a presidency, and tonight is one of those moments when it's also about assessing where we've been, where we're going, and whether anything really has changed and how. Where our panel will join us in just a moment. We're going to start by asking a question on a different topic of each member of the panel, and then we'll open it up for a broader conversation. Uh, we will open it up for your questions uh, later in the evening as well. So this is a real discussion. Uh, and there will be, when that point in the night comes, there'll be microphones. You can spend the next hour and a half, or the next hour, don't worry, <laughs> uh, thinking about what questions you'd like to ask, and then we'll give you some instructions later on. Just a couple things we did want to mention. Uh, a thanks to um, th some of the folks in the room who are former presidents of the White House Correspondents Association. Thank you so much for coming and for being here tonight. And uh, we'd like to welcome all of you, students, media, academic, scholars, members of the public. Very much want to, want, want to welcome the media in the room, and we look forward to it. Now, it is OK to look at your phones tonight, as long as you don't do it too much. So if you want to engage your social media, we'd love to spread the word. Our hashtag is Year of Trump on Twitter and Instagram. Um, we would ask you, though, uh, both with those thoughts that you share and for the questions and the, and the, and the responses that you have here this evening, to do it in a, a fully respectful way. I think one of the things that we have seen that is most under siege in this country is the notion of civil discourse. And we here at GW, among other things, very much want to stand for that. Serious, honest, direct engagement, but always civil and respectful. 
and uh, tweet away or snap or whatever you like, but uh, please turn your ringers off. And if you can, please keep enough of your attention focused so that you can hear what's actually going on in we progress. Are, we are really looking forward to this conversation. Margaret and I had a couple of drinks, non-alcoholic yesterday. <laughs> it was coffee. This. So, so it's like, where do we begin? Hmm. Well, probably a good place to begin would be with introductions. Let's do it. So, shall we do that? Yeah. So, it is my great pleasure to start our introductions with someone you know, even if you don't know him, um, because you've probably seen him or somebody playing him on Saturday Night Live. Please welcome Glenn Thrush from the New York Times. Thank you, you. Thank you Glenn. Not him, Have a seat. Yeah, not him. Um, you also know our next guest uh, from Fox News, and also because President Trump feels safe and comfortable with him, likes his questions, and likes to engage with him. So please welcome John Roberts from Fox. Safe. <laughs> Thanks for doing it. I'm John. Just because I'm Trump bait, I mean, <laughs> they get him to come over and talk to him. Uh, for those of you at the School of Media and Public Affairs, uh, you know our next guest because we're privileged to have her as one of our Turker Fellows this year. She spends time with students, with faculty, and with others. She's also very well known to millions of Americans and others around the world for her many years at the White House. Uh, April Ryan is, of course, the White House correspondent with American Urban Radio Networks and also a, an analyst with CNN. April Ryan. Hi, April. Do I get one too? <laughs> yes, <my love. laughs> Thank you. Um, our next panelist is the vice president of the White House Correspondents Association. He will succeed me uh, next summer, and uh, also the chief uh, Washington and White House correspondent for uh, Yahoo, Olivier Knox. Hi, Hi Olivier. Uh, do we have students in the room? How many students in the room? Raise your hand. Oh, look wow, at that. Great. Any political science majors in the room? Anybody studying politics? Anybody taking a course with political science? Okay, so this person needs no introduction, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, she is a professor of political science. She has written about the presidency, about Congress, about legislative gridlock. Her recent book, her next book, is on the Federal Reserve, Sarah Binder. Professor Sarah Binder. And last but certainly not least, uh, it is, it's maybe a little bit intimidating to look at a room like this and a panel like this and, uh, and think that you're the representative of the Trump administration, but we know that she is uh, uh, more than capable of doing uh, a great job tonight. Uh, we really want to thank her very much for her participation tonight. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the White House Press Secretary. Before, before you sit uh -oh. down, Sarah, maybe you could... Already on the uh -oh. hot spot. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't take long, right? right. Oh. No, 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 this is... Um, I'm, you're, I'm fascinated, and I think people are here too, um, that why you came here and, and what it is you want to um, be able to talk about. Maybe you should ask me that question about an hour and a half after this is over. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think uh, forums like this are important. I think the ability for the administration to be open, transparent, answer questions is a very important part of my job. I try to do that every day. And uh, I'm hoping maybe this crowd is a little bit nicer than the one I sometimes face. Though, uh, well, <laughs> you brought a few of my friends back here, but uh, I think this is, uh, again, a great opportunity to talk about some of the things that we've done over the last year um, and hopefully have a friendly and, and fun back and forth conversation. We want to understand how you go about your job, how you view your job, and how you think your boss is doing his job. So I'm looking forward to hearing you respond to that. Oh, good. I've got some time to think then on this. <laughs> All right. Well, and you know, um, we pegged tonight's event, or we got as close as we could to about a year 
since uh, that historic election last November. Of course, on November the 8th, President Trump and you uh, will be somewhere in the middle of a 12-day trip across Asia. So uh, tonight is an opportunity to assess uh, all of the changes, not just to the White House, uh, but to the political landscape, to the way journalists and presidents interact, and, uh, and perhaps some comparisons between the campaign and the way President Trump has governed. So um, I know for my part, I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great night. All Excited. Right. Thanks for having me. Join us. Thanks, John. So as I mentioned, what we'll do is I'd like to start by, by uh, posing a question, and, and Margaret and I will take turns with this to each of you to get the conversation going, and then we'll, we'll open it up, as I said, and I mentioned to the audience that they'll uh, join us in the questioning a bit later. So, uh, Sarah, let's, let's start with you, uh, since we're taking stock of things. Uh, the president made big and disruptive <laughs> promises as a candidate. Um, and um, a lot of the promises he made, he said, were going to be quick or easy, or suggested that. The wall, repealing Obamacare, which was going to happen on the first day, tax reform, infrastructure. He's had a lot of trouble with each. So in thinking about that and where he goes, this is, this is the question. And that is, revolves around priorities. Secretary Mnuchin said on Fox News last week that tax reform is the t top priority. We had Corey Lewandowski, you know him. He was here on campus not too long ago. He said if Donald Trump doesn't build the wall, he won't get reelected. That should be the top priority. A recent Harvard political poll of Republicans showed their top priority was repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act. 53% said so that was extremely important. What does the president think he could have done differently to get any of these things done? And what is his top priority now? I think that one of the reasons that Donald Trump is president is because there is such a frustration with the way that Washington functions. Uh, and I think we've seen a lot of that over these first nine months in office. Um, you have so many things get lost in process, and it's very hard to push things through, uh, regardless of whether or not you have a Republican majority, particularly when it's a narrow majority, it makes it very tough to, I, I think, in in force big and bold change like Donald Trump would like to do. Uh, but we are making a lot of progress, maybe not as fast as uh, certainly I think the president wants and certainly probably not as much as America wants. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that the congressional uh, polling numbers are so low because there is such a frustration that it's so polarized that they don't have the ability to get a lot done. Right now, I would say the biggest priority is tax reform. We're in the, the, the heat and the heart of that. Uh, I think that we will get that done by the end of this year. And I think that historic tax cuts that the president has proposed and is pushing through uh, will be a massive change to our economic system, certainly. Um, really, I think, empower the economy in a new way through these historic tax cuts, help middle class families. That's a big priority for this president and something I think that we're going to see happen in the next couple of months. I know I said we'd move one on one, but I just want to ask one mini follow up out of that. You said that's one of the reasons Congress, Congress's numbers are so low, that nothing's been done. Is that one of the reasons his numbers are so low? The his numbers are a lot better than Congress. I'll take the president's numbers over Congress any day. Uh, again, I think that one of the reasons that you have President Trump is the president is because he is not your typical politician. They were looking for somebody to come in and change Washington, change the status quo, shake things up, and he's certainly done that. I don't think anybody could argue that he hasn't done that, that he hasn't been somebody who has disrupted the way that the system normally operates. Um, does that mean we're getting everything done on day one? No, but we've gotten a lot of things done in very short order. Uh, you have ISIS on the run. You have the economy stronger than it's been in decades. You have unemployment at a 16-year low. Uh, I mean, these are massive things that have taken place in short nine months. Uh, and a lot of these things he's been able to do uh, more, frankly, I think, in those eight months, particularly when it comes to things like the uh, strength of the economy, like the defeat of ISIS uh, in the position that we're in, far more in these first eight months than Obama did in eight years. And I think that's a big, big progress and big steps in the right direction. We'll come back to all of that, I'm sure. Mr. Thrush. <laughs> um, Just I'll go with what she said. Yeah, right, what she said. Um, President Trump's first year, uh, of course, has been marked by a lot of 
well-known and reported internal competition, um, some staff churn, everyone from uh, Michael Flynn at the NSC, Jim Comey, uh, the HHS secretary, uh, Mr. Price, um, Sean Spicer, <laughs> Anthony Scaramucci, Steve Bannon, Rice Priebus. Uh, I feel like I might be forgetting a couple people. And there are a couple people. <laughs> yeah, I think we got price. And there are a couple of uh, remaining cabinet advisors or, or, or top advisors who have been sort of under threat of will he, won't he uh, stay or go. Um, how, other than the kind of political reportage, uh, how do you think that has actually affected the management of the executive branch and the process of, of governance in the early months of this White House? It's a, a great question. For, the first thing I'd like to do uh, is I'd like to thank Sarah for coming. I know it's very difficult to be kind of outnumbered, and I think it's... Kind of outnumbered? <laughs> <laughs> Inc incredibly cool that she would come here and sub submit herself uh, to this sort of thing. Um, the, uh, <laughs> it's just a conversation. That's right. you're, oh, setting that's, it up, you're setting it up to be oh, really Oh, Frank, that's what you glam. think. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I think, I think part of the problem with this White House in general has been the fact that uh, they are learning on the job. So, so a lot of the disruption that, that we've referred to, and I, I, there's no question that the mood in the country or significant parts of the country is really restive. People wanted to change. They want things shaken up. But I don't think they wanted it necessarily quite shaken up in this way. Um, and you see that reflected in a lot of the polling, which shows that the president has lost a significant amount of support from independents, uh, without whom, particularly in the south part of the country, he would not have been elected president. Oh. I shut up. Why do you always accuse me of something? I'm off. Check your phone. My phone. Check your phone. It's dead. Yeah, it's dead, all right. Uh, <laughs> which makes, go, which go. makes you even more questionable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just let that one go. Uh, no, I, I think in general, part of the issue is this guy's learning on the job. He, did, he had no experience in this, and that was a benefit during the campaign. And I think part of the problem is his brand precludes him from saying he's learning on the job. So he can't uh, necessarily... Uh, do what a lot of presidents in this position, and he hasn't. A lot of presidents haven't been in this position, which is to say, essentially, that I'm ramping, uh, that I'm ramping up, and there, and that I think reflects itself in the way that, uh, with all due respect, some of the communication comes through. I thought with, with General Kelly a couple of days ago, what was noteworthy to me was uh, is not so much that he he made what appears to be a fairly significant error, in fact, with regard uh, to this issue of uh, the Congresswoman's characterization. Uh, the congresswoman's characterization of the conversation and the, and the characterization of the congresswoman, Congresswoman Wilson's uh, speech that she gave at the opening of the FBI office a couple of oh. years ago. But the fact that there was not an immediate attempt to, to, to deal with that. Clearly the general, and, and I'm imputing this, you know, mis, uh, misremembered to some extent. Perhaps he had a different impression of what occurred. That's a fairly easy matter of fact to clear up. But, and I, I won't name the senior administration official uh, who said this to me, but very early on uh, d during uh, the presidency, probably in February or March, I made, uh, I don't think I made an error in a story, but there was, uh, I think, a, a failure to communicate. I didn't get someone to comment on deadline. And the senior admin administration called me up to complain about it. I said I would deal with it immediately online. And then I said to them, I'm really sorry about this. And then that person said something to me which was really telling. They said, don't apologize, it's a sign of weakness. <laughs> I don't view apologizing or admitting error or admitting that you made a mistake in fact to be a sign of weakness. I view it to be a sign of strength. And uh, I think in terms of uh, the president and his approval ratings and his interactions with all these branches of government and the American people at large, that he would probably be doing himself a favor if he would admit as everyone else around him is capable of seeing that he is in fact learning on the job. A uh, lot there. John Roberts, um, let's talk politics for a minute. <clears throat> Senator Bob Corker, Senator Luther Strange, Representative Charlie Dent, Dave Reichert, Representative Ileana ross Leitman have either announced their retirement or, in Strange's case, been defeated mm -hmm. um, in a special primary race. Uh, the Breitbart boss and former um, advisor to President Trump, Steve Bannon, 
spoke of a season of war against the GOP establishment. What impact, from your perspective, and you've covered politics for a long time, you know this very, very well. That's not a joke about your age, don't be offended. No, no, no. <laughs> Just because I covered the first Roosevelt presidency <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> doesn't, doesn't make me Bully for you. older than you. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, what what uh, impact has this year of upheaval, uh, do you think, had on the Republican Party and, and, and conservatism? I, I think that the ultimate um, effect of that remains to be seen. You know, if Steve Bannon does really push a, a lot of uh, alternate candidates uh, going into the, the midterm elections, I think that it could have a fairly dramatic effect on the Republican Party. Mitch McConnell seems to think that it, it's a bad idea to float the type of candidate that Steve Bannon is, is putting out there, hence the reason why he said uh, the other day with the president repeated again on Sunday that his goal is to get candidates who can be elected and therefore maintain a majority in, in Congress. I think the biggest problem for the Republican Party is they have been screaming long and loud, give us the House, give us the Senate, give us the White House, and you'll see things get done. But things in Congress haven't gotten done yet. And the president suffered um, a stinging defeat twice when the Senate couldn't pass repeal and replace of Obamacare. Now, there are probably a lot of people in this country who are very thankful that that didn't get done. But if you're a Republican and you want to get elected in, in 2018, or if you're a Republican president and you want to get things done, you're looking at that saying, we gave you the keys to the kingdom and now you're not getting anything done. And you've been promising for the past seven years that the first thing you were going to do when you got the majorities in both houses in the, in the White House was repeal and replace Obamacare. They won three elections on that, and they didn't get it done. When push came to shove, when push came to shove, after all of those show votes that they took in the Congress to say, well, we know this isn't going to do anything, so we'll vote yes, repeal and replace, where when the rubber met the road, they choked. And I think a lot of Republicans across the country are looking at that and saying, we keep sending you to Congress on the promise that you're going to get something done, and you don't do it. So then all of these alternative candidates start to float to the surface a little bit more, and many of those are people that Mitch McConnell says won't get elected. So the Republican Party could end up shooting itself in the foot because it couldn't get done what it promised to get done, but I still think it's a little bit early to see the full effect of that. Next one. April. Uh, April covers urban communities across the United States, and I know this is a big focus of your reporting. And uh, other things. Among other things, yes. <laughs> uh, if you were to highlight just one or two policy issues that you think have had the biggest impact um, on urban communities, which ones would you highlight? And are those the same issues that you think have gotten the most coverage? No. What we're hearing in the news that's affecting the urban community right now is the issue of taking the knee. And this president has a major microphone. He has a bully pulpit. He was able to write the narrative saying it was about the flag and, and about the soldiers and about this country, which it was not disrespect about that. Those who are taking the knee are challenging the system um, that has been a problem for a long time when it comes to police-involved shootings. That issue still has yet to be addressed, and we know that the president, when he was president-elect and also when he was a candidate, he was supporting policing. The black community supports good policing, but they want to weed out bad policing. I think about um, when then-candidate Trump was running for the Oval Office, and he was talking about an inner-city fix. And then I fast forward to February when I asked him about that inner-city fix. He talked about issues of crime. He talked about issues of health care. He talked about issues of education. And I even asked him about the CBC. And they did ultimately have a meeting. But a lot of those issues are still yet to be dealt with. When it comes to issues of crime, there's a big problem. And the Congressional Black Caucus is talking about this right now. The Trump administration now is um, dealing with, uh, or, or, or in the midst of working out this plan, which the CBC considers Hoover-esque, where if you are, um, self-identifying or black identifying and protesting, they are now uh, getting a file and you now have a file. And that's very Hoover-esque. So when it comes to the issues of education, you know, let's talk about HBCUs, that still is floundering. 
Um, there were 122 HBCUs now. There are 100 HBCU, historically, black. historically black colleges and universities. Many of those schools were formed, nine of them right now celebrating 150 years. And when you think about when those schools were founded, they came out 150 years ago. It was two years after the Emancipation Proclamation when black people were told that they were free. We could not, and, I, and forgive me, but you know, we could not go to schools with white people. Betsy DeVos got the, the whole thing wrong in that we could not at that time go to schools with white people. And for slaves to build brick by brick to educate their future, that was a lot. And then to play with this, or not play, but have it floundering. Many in the African American community are very upset about that because that is one of the key pieces for African Americans to propel into the middle income status. So there are a lot of issues that are still on the table. I'm waiting and listening for some of that, um, for some of those issues to come around. Um, education, crime, I, we haven't really heard about the crime yet. And, and the Affordable Care Act, ACA. Yes, it has problems. ACA, the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, that Republicans gave to President Obama and he embraced saying, yes, Obama cares. The issue was trying to help the least of these with insurance. Yes, you had high deductibles. Yes, you had some issues. But there's a strong concern within the black community that with this new um, round of, of executive orders on what's to be done, it's going to affect the least of these. So when it comes to issues of urban America, um, the jury's still out, but it doesn't look good right now. If I could, I'd just like to jump in just to clarify something, particularly on HBCUs and education. Um, President Trump has actually done more in terms of elevating HBCUs. He's moved that office back into the White House so that it has it's been empowered in a greater uh, level, given a bigger platform instead of having it housed at the Department of Education. They have uh, committed to the funding. There's no floundering on that far. And, and furthermore, on education, one of the things that I think is very helpful uh, is the idea of school choice, which is very popular within urban communities because it allows students That's true. To, to move around. And he has been a champion for that, as has the Department of Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. So I think those are actually ways that we are taking bigger steps. But on HBCUs. Uh, and, and look, this wasn't a problem that was created overnight. We're not going right. to be able to fix it overnight. But we are taking very big steps uh, in the right direction mm -hmm. to move that ball forward and to empower those communities and to do more and kind of open up that conversation. So if I may, um, the HBCU presidents, which I've talked to, I, I polled many of them. Um, they were told that when they came in in February, at the end of February, they were told by Steve Bannon that give us a list of what you want. And they wanted um, money for Title III. They wanted year-round Pell Grant, which they did get through Congress. Um, and which they, the Trump administration supported, but... Okay, but they, it, was, it had been, they were working on it prior to, but that's true. Um, but then they also had, um, they had asked for a one-time lump sum of $25 billion. And then they, when they heard what the president said about the budget, about giving to HBCUs could be unconstitutional because of race issues, that really made, I mean, the president that, did that, say that. That's not actually what he said, but it's fine. Okay, well, what did he say I, then? Do you have a response to that? Because I want to move down and we'll come back to all yeah, of this. We'll, we'll come, we can come back to all of it. I, I think the, the broader point is, is that you want to launch these very uh, generic attacks against this administration when we've actually done uh, a lot of the things. Did everything on that list get completed? No, but several of those items did, and we're continuing to work to move uh, and complete more of the things on that list. But before we go, so. I, I didn't attack. I just gave you, the, I, I'm not attacking. We are, this is civil discourse. I'm laying out <laughs> what I was asked to lay out. And, and look, this is, this, is, this is where you get to, because you have policy pronouncements, and then you have details, and you have interpretations of same. So lots, lots, lots to pursue. We're not going to get to everything tonight tonight, certainly. But Olivia, let me come to you. I mean, we heard from Sarah earlier, and, and dead on, right, that this president was, and, and, and John, you were talking about this, this president was elected as an expression of discontent at the way, at the way Washington uh, has, has behaved. I like to say, if you want to burn down the house, you hire the arsonist. And, and <laughs> Donald Trump said, we got to burn this house down. Uh, his, his, his metaphor is wow. the swamp. He said, I'm going to drain the swamp. How's he doing? The swamp drained? 
he's not doing nearly as well in draining the swamp than he is, as he is in rolling back uh, systematically a lot of regulations, a lot of them uh, embraced by the previous administration through ex executive action. And the reason that I connect these two ideas, if you go back to uh, early April, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, a senior Trump advisor, Mr. Mulvaney, identified one core principle of drain the swamp, which is remove the influence of lobbyists on policy. Uh, now, what we've actually seen is a phalanx of former Trump campaign aides either start or join major lobbying firms. And in places like the Environmental Protection Agency, you've seen a lot of policy devolved to people who were lobbyists um, and who may shortly return to that, to that profession. So I want to connect these two ideas, because on the one hand, no, the swamp's not drained. On the other hand, without the expertise of a lot of these folks from industry, you would not see one of the signal successes of the Trump administration. It's something that doesn't get as much coverage, maybe, uh, as, as the, the latest tweet. Um, but it's a very, very important story from this administration, which is that systematic, methodical rollback of executive regulation. We'll talk more about that. Um, the other Sarah, Professor Bender. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what it means for President Trump to be a Republican this year. Um, he has seemingly had a lot of tension with the Republican-controlled Congress, even though there's one-party control. And at the same time, he seems to be working toward a goal with that Republican Congress, maybe a two-pronged goal, one of attempting to get things accomplished uh, that fit his agenda, and, and two of uh, trying to shape a Republican Party that's a little bit more in his vision. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask you why you think that tension exists. And also, he ran as a Republican, but do you see President Trump as a Republican, or do you see him as a third party candidate um, or, a, or a no party candidate? So I definitely see him as Republican, right? No matter what the mix of policy issue is, and no matter what direction he wants to move the, the party, he runs at the end of the day with an R after his name, and all the Republicans run with an R after the name. So we're, voters will see them as Republicans, regardless of the policies really um, the differences amongst the party. I think the, the problem here is that precisely what you put your finger on, it is a fractured Republican majority. And those fractures were here before the election, but we didn't notice them so much in the minority because they really weren't responsible for governing. They had someone else to be Absolutely. against. Yeah. And so now in a position of control, uh, they have to deal with the fact we're in a polarized system. Uh, the two parties disagree about what the problems are, what the solutions are. It's a small majority. It's fractured, and they really are looking to the president to kind of pave the way forward. Um, that's a role presidents often can play because they have the political, broad, public stature to do that. Um, you don't have to be a policy wonk to play that role, uh, but you have to choose a position. You have to use your bully pulpit to maintain the party's position. Uh, fellow members of your party, again, even if they disagree with you on policy, they need to be convinced that because you're behind it, they should get behind it too. Um, but you have to choose an issue. You have to choose a position. And I think many, judging from reporting, uh, many lawmakers, Republican lawmakers, aren't quite sure where the president stands on any given issue. Um, and that's, that's complicated, uh, building a majority, because you know, majorities don't just happen. They have to be built. Do you think, quickly before we move on, that any Republican president had one of the other 16 uh, emerged? As the nominee and then one, do you think that any Republican president would have actually had a bit of trouble governing as the leader of this Republican Party? Well, there's certainly fractures in the Republican Party that would have emerged and certainly would have emerged on Obamacare, repeal and replace. Tax reform, I think we'd be seeing similar issues. The question is, could another president, different president, really um, set the agenda and stick to the agenda and make clear and put all resources behind that agenda. And do they have the public stature outside Washington? What's their public approval, right? Do they have what we call in the business, full of science business, right? The power to persuade. And your persuasion as president depends on how people in Washington see you. Early wins, they have reason to get behind you. Public, uh, public prefer you, broad public, do you reach out? That's going to build your public prestige, and that's what presidents can use. That's what I think we could imagine another Republican in that position with the same fractures might be making more progress, but it's still a pretty fractured majority. So let's open the conversation up then to, to, to the group. I mean, a lot of you have talked about 
the different nature of this president and presidency, about some of the political exigencies that exist. You've talked about the swamp that they came in and up against. You've talked about being very new at this. I mean, obviously, Donald Trump was not in government. You've talked about the things that have been done. Um, in looking forward and in thinking about what's, what's been done over the past, what has the president learned from this year? How do you see him taking those lessons and applying them to be, frankly, more effective at getting some of these things done uh, that haven't been done, uh, uh, broadening his base as opposed to merely playing to his base? And to all, um, how would you assess um, um, some of what uh, you have seen and, and, and what needs to play out? Sarah, why don't you start with that? There's a lot of questions in one. So I, I'll, I, I'll, I broke my, I'll try to, my I'll principal try to rule of asking one question at a time. So <laughs> She's I used to that. I'll try to. <laughs> That's right. These, guys, these guys break that all the time. So, How about uh, what the president has learned in his year and all? You know, I think a lot of it would be um, on the relationship development side. I think that he has well, done. He needs to have more of them. Um, I, well, I was actually going to go the opposite way. Is that fewer of them? So, uh, particularly, no, on the um, foreign policy stage, I think he's done a very good job of developing relationships with a lot of key partners and allies, uh, particularly I think you look at um, the Asia trip that we're getting ready to go on, he's developed very strong relationships uh, with Abe, with Xi, with a lot of the leaders that are really helping uh, grow the amount of pressure that is being put on North Korea, which is one of the greatest threats I think that our country faces today. But I'm talking about today. Sorry, being legislatively effective here in Washington, what he's learned and what he's... Well, I, 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 I didn't know you were speaking specifically legislative years, kind of a little broad uh, of lessons learned. Uh, legislatively, I think to, to take a, a bigger role of engagement um, in health care, he did towards the end, but not as much on the front end. And you're seeing that happen a lot more with the tax reform tax cut plan that's being enacted very much uh, forward leaning far more engaged uh, very early on and kind of laying out the parameters and laying out the foundation of what he'd like to see in that plan, working directly with members of Congress to develop that plan, and then really helping drive uh, that through to completion. And so I, I think that you look at kind of the process from healthcare to the process that is being put in place for the uh, passage of tax cuts, I, I think those are pretty different approaches, and certainly we're already seeing, I think, more success already to date on the momentum and the forward progress on the tax cut. I think that the president has discovered over these last nine months that he can't rely on members of his own party to get things done. And if he reaches out to the Democrats, he might get a couple of things done, but I think he has to be realistic in that they'll stick the knife in his back the moment they get the opportunity to on a number of different issues. The Democrats will. The Democrats. What about the Republicans? No, the Democrats stick him in the front. <laughs> That's the difference. <clears throat> I mean, when you, when you look at it, his, 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 his real problems getting things done have come down to a handful of people. Uh, it's come down to Rand Paul, who continues to refuse to vote for anything that involves a dollar sign. Uh, you've got Susan Collins, who stands on principle. You've got John McCain, who stands on principle. And then Lisa Murkowski seems a little bit fungible, depending on whether or not she can get the process that she wants done. So it's really down to just a handful of people that are blocking him from getting done what he needs to get done in the Senate. But you know they're, they're standing on their principles. I think Paul is standing on the principle of, I need to say this because if I want to get reelected, this is what I pledge to do my entire political life. And then the other ones probably could be, could be convinced to do it if they're given the right set of parameters in order to become comfortable. Am I right or wrong? Possibly. I, I don't know if some of those are uh, more principal and less, uh, you know, Posture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> posturing might be a better word. Sarah, the president um, tells us quite a bit how great things are. I want to hear from you the defining moments on the negative side. There are always positives and negatives with every presidency. The defining moments in these nine months, and if you could give us a look into that, and also, is this week a defining moment? in these nine months for this president? Is this week a defining yes, moment? Yes, as it relates to Niger. Um, I, I would not say that this is the defining moment. I certainly think. A um, one of many or a defining moment. I, I wouldn't characterize it as that. I think the media would like for it to be. 
Um, they want to create a narrative that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, and I think that there is certainly a desire to make this into um, a situation of kind of an attack point on the president. I don't necessarily agree with that um, process at all. I think in terms of the negative, um, I mean, I, I think the biggest negative would be Congress's inability to do their job. It's their job to legislate. It's the president's job to be the executive, to lay out kind of the priorities, the principles, help drive those, uh, use the bully pulpit, which he has done. Uh, I think, uh, to John's point, you've got a few people that are holding up, I think, a lot of progress. And to me, that would be the greatest negative, is Congress's inability to step up and do their job, particularly uh, members that have been campaigning on a lot of these things uh, over the last seven years, uh, some of them even longer. And now they have an opportunity to really step up and do some big things, and I hope they'll take it. Will there be an apology this how, week? How, how about how he's used the, the bully pulpit? Well, look, I think, uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, hey, I'm not averse to beating up on Congress here. I think it's a pretty fair, uh, fair thing to do. But we are talking about a presidency in the first nine months that has not functioned as a normal presidency. We see just hundreds of positions unfilled. I think all you have to really look at to understand what has happened was the president's policy page on his campaign website, which you can continue to look at, and it will say 401, or was it 404 error, or an empty page. Mm -hmm. There was not a lot of policy the president did not release anywhere near the sort of uh, specific policy proposals that uh, I would say, I, I would venture to say I didn't look at every single website, but probably any candidate in the entire race or any candidate in any recent race. There was not a policy focus by the president at all. And our reporting has shown exhaustively, particularly on the healthcare debate, that he was uninformed about basic facts about the healthcare system in this country. Um, I've interviewed, and my colleagues have interviewed dozens of people who who attest in good faith to the fact that the president was not prepared for a lot of these policy discussions. I think he is more conversant with the tax issue because it is something that he is more familiar with, but particularly on areas uh, such as health care and entitlement reform and the budget, uh, he has not been as conversant and he has also not been as studious as previous presidents. Uh, this is not an opinion, this is based on a certain volume of reporting. Now, in terms of, we were having a, a colloquy back and forth between April uh, and Sarah about urban America. I started my career covering low-income neighborhoods in New York City, and I'm not that familiar with the historical black college issue, but I can speak to the Community Development Block Grant Program, mm -hmm. which is one of the central components of uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, really the principal means by which the federal government is able to ameliorate poverty. Uh, both in terms of housing and community services. Uh, Director Mulvaney of the Office of Management and Budget zeroed it out in his skinny budget this year. So uh, the block grants were zeroed. Congress will definitely restore it, likely to, the, likely to par. But uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of his commitment to urban America, um, I think the community development block grant, people like Tim Scott, the Republican senator, African-American, Republican Center from South Carolina has identified that as well as a defining issue. So I think while we're talking about there is a tremendous amount of dysfunction uh, in Congress, and they certainly didn't deliver, uh, particularly Paul Ryan more than Mitch McConnell, because Paul Ryan, remember, set the order of battle with Ryan's Priebus, the, the president's first chief of staff. But I would say a fair amount of responsibility in terms of this gridlock and dysfunction uh, rests uh, on the president. Um I'd like to throw out a question about U.S. leadership in the world and um, if or how the president's um, approach to that or take on that has changed uh, since he first took office. Um, we could be talking about global PACs, Paris, or whatever. We could also be talking about um, his uh, both interest and instinct for engaging with foreign leaders, some allies that he's made. Um, some testing of boundaries that he's done. And I, I want to start with Sarah, but jump it around that to, seems to, to be anybody else. always start with me. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I, I sort of want you to frame this for us because uh, I think during the campaign, we really thought about him as um, a, a domestic-focused president who had a couple of international issues, primarily security and trade, 
job creation that he wanted to hammer on, but that his, his focus would really be at home. And then I think we saw in the spring with the uh, summit with uh, the Chinese leader Xi at, at Mar-a-Lago, um, almost like an evolution, a turn towards understanding that there was real leverage and power in those kind of relationships. But you're so much more on the inside than we are. Can you talk a little bit about uh, his, the evolution in terms of his thinking about what's possible with foreign relationships? I think uh, ultimately um, there are a lot of different kind of aspects to the foreign relationships. One that you mentioned, trade. Uh, the president's very focused on making sure that the trade deals that we have are good deals for American workers. I think he uh, very strongly feels that in the past a lot of the deals have benefited other countries over the American worker. And so he's really tried to put an emphasis in negotiations uh, to make sure that whatever trade deals we have in place benefit that worker. Uh, one of the other big places I think is putting pressure on uh, countries like North Korea. And I think he's really done a great job of developing relationships and strengthening existing relationships that we have with allies and partners like Korea, uh, South Korea, like China, like Japan, to really help put additional pressure on North Korea. Uh, that's been, I, I think, a very bi big focal point. You've seen him step up with more comprehensive plans to address uh, Afghanistan and Iran, not just looking at like one aspect, but working uh, interagency process and with a number of stakeholders to really bring about um, a more holistic approach to deal with places like Afghanistan and Iran instead of just looking at individual issues. Uh, that first trip, I believe uh, a couple of you have may have been on his first foreign trip, that uh, was very historic moment in uh, Saudi Arabia in the speech that he gave to, I believe it was like 68 Muslim majority countries, uh, bringing a lot of those individuals in to really talk about working together to combat terrorism. Uh, that was a historic moment, something that had not been done before. And I think a lot of that was uh, a big kind of transition point to for the administration and certainly uh, a, a big PowerPoint of the first few months of him being in office was that speech and that moment um, and the collective countries coming together to really for the first time say we're going to work together and we're going to look for ways to defeat terrorism. And that I think is probably uh, certainly a major moment in his presidency up until this point. I'm jumping in around the room. I mean, Russia has not been that, first of all, for, for a number of reasons. But uh, also, it seems to me that. Um, just what to do with those relationships, how far to take them, and kind of for what purpose is still something that he's testing and trying to figure out. Yeah, remember, it's a two-way street. It's, it's not just President Trump defining these relationships. These other leaders are trying to define them as well. And so back, back in March, I talked to uh, folks at about 12 uh, embassies in DC, major allies from all around the world. And the most consistent thing I heard back was, look, yeah, we can get Defense Secretary Mattis on the phone. Sure, we you know we can get all these other people on the phone, but at the end, and we have a really good conversation about what to do in Afghanistan. And at the very end of the call, they say, "On the other hand, the president hasn't weighed in, so it." Eh. And that's been a real, <clears throat> that's changing a little bit now because what's happening now is the president's committed himself to courses of action that are not easily reversed. We're not talking about a tweet; we're talking about committing new troops to Afghanistan. We're not talking about a tweet; we're talking about this really complicated puzzle with North Korea, and so. Allies, and I would guess, though I haven't spoken to them, adversaries, are taking a different measure of this president at this point. Also in part because this White House is not as chaotic um, as, it, as it used to be. I mean, it's, it's night and day between January 20th oh, and today on, on, every, on every front. Or even June 20th, really. Sure, right, yeah. sure. There's still some issues, though. But. <laughs> why don't you? Why don't you? <laughs> what, what, what but are but, the, why, but I, think, I think that would be actually very interesting, and I'd like to ask you to share uh, some of your impressions with the audience, both on how you see and how you report that the White House is being run, and also on the relationship between the, the media, the press, and, and the White House, because um, that was 
also very contentious for, mm. for, a, for a period of time. Well, no. I, th I think it's, I think I it's changed, I don't, I don't it's think changed it. immensely <laughs> since Sarah took over. <laughs> we all skip through the daisies and watch the butterflies well, every day, so don't hold on. we? No, 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 Olivia is, is right. Hold on a second. Olivia is I right. This hold on a second. This, yeah. this White House does work a lot better than it was in the early Listen, days. Listen, here's, here's an example, okay? Um, <laughs> here's, here's a big contrast between the Sean Spicer era and the Sarah Sanders era. Since Sarah took over, not one person in the White House press shop has peddled me a poisonous story about Sarah. <laughs> that was not true under Sean. What happened when under Sean? I, I can't even describe the kind of garbage that they were peddling to, I think, a lot of us on this panel about oh, Sean, really I personal email, stuff, yeah. uh -huh. uh, trying to undermine him. Mm -hmm. That has not happened under Sarah. And so credit to you, I think, for that. Um, but it, it operates very, very differently. Just Margaret, has the, has the relationship with the, with the, with the press improved? If I can ask you and put you on the spot as the, as the Bloomberg correspondent and White House Correspondent Association president? It's, um, the relationship is certainly different. And I think part of it is uh, that Sarah's approach has been uh, to let the president approach the media as he instinctively wants to, but that there is a difference between the president's relationship with the media and the White House staff's relationship, the pre White House press staff's relationship with the media. I mean, you tell me if you think that's fair or not, but um, the uh, the temperature is certainly down. They're always, look, I mean, just for everyone who's in the audience and not in our briefing room every day, uh, under the, uh, in the opening months of the administration, the show that you would see during the briefings made it seem like it was completely antagonistic and on fire at all times and and burning and smoke and people running around it's because it was well but in but in but in fact there although was, it was there was no actual smoke I don't know. no actual smoke although it was certainly more chaotic than it is now uh, the press was still absolutely always from the beginning of the administration in the motorcades in the briefing room uh, there was a time when there weren't briefings but for the most part there were briefings people had access to go into lower and upper press to ask questions it, it was. I know. I'm trying was, to figure out this more, press. It was certainly more confrontational. Are we going to have to argue Sa with now, you more than we do with no, Sarah? Stop it. No, Sa no. Let me let me say <laughs> this. Yes, yes, Sarah goes to that, and, and, and Sarah comes to that podium, and I mean we've had our little back and forth, but I'm I don't you know it's it's. I, I guess think I'm winning her over. No, you're not. But anyway, <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, but. No, I mean, no, you, you, you clearly, when Sean left, you picked up the mantle and you charged in. You, and I understand as a woman in that role and who you work for, you have to come out and show you take no prisoners. You do that. And I, I mean, it's a friendly adversarial relationship, but when you don't like something, you make it known. And I'm not... Why you don't give I me other eye up I here. I should do that. Is that not... I mean, I'm not saying... Yeah. But no, but I'm not... I hear Margaret, but it's... I've seen you give and I've seen you take. And um, I'm, not, I'm not giving you flowers or anything, but I'm just saying, there is, what did you say? I said you should. I should give her flowers? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, but what I'm saying is, I understand being a woman in this male-dominated business, and I understand who you have to respond to. But at the same time, I mean, you know, last Monday, it was like, Come to the Rose Garden now. I mean, all of us were scrambling. It is not as 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 organized as we would like or they might like. Sometimes it's it's kind of chaotic. It's not as I mean, I hear you. And I understand your I, I position. I think well, we can all have our WCA. perceptions of it, but you really are the most important answer here. Uh, maybe, I mean, I'd like to hear it, and I'm sure <laughs> the audience would. What is your take on both what your job is? You have to juggle. Uh, you work for the president, you work for the taxpayers, you uh, are supposed to be facilitating conversations with journalists, but you're a public servant also. How do you weigh those parts of the job and how do you view your job as press secretary? I, I mean, I think the, the number one job I have is to come out and provide the best and most accurate information I can give at that moment. Um, and as, as give the most full picture I can of the process, the policy, and the position of the administration. And that's what I try to come out and do every day. Some days I do it better than others. Uh, some days, um, you know, I think that it's less tense than others. And, and some of that is based on the news that is taking place. If it's a more controversial topic, then I think the tension in the room is going to be higher. And you'll leave uh, early. 
<laughs> You'll leave in five minutes. <laughs> Never left in five minutes. Well, maybe uh, 10. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that the biggest thing, too, that, that people may not see is regardless of whether or not, um, you know, I may be at the podium for, for 20 or 25 minutes, I'm in the office for 15 hours of the day. And a lot of the individuals here, uh, they may not ask their question in the briefing room, but I talk to them on the phone, by email. Uh, John stocks outside of my office a good couple of hours every day, uh, making he sure stalks you? that, I mean, you know, sometimes it kind of feels that yeah. way. Um, Watch so, that. John. <laughs> Harmless stocking. Yeah. But I, I, I think stocking. That the, the point is, is that we provide information in a number of ways, and sometimes that's through the press briefing. And I think that um, the part there that should be more focused on is helping give information to the American people directly and being able to answer questions so that they can hear those answers because they don't have the option to come by my office uh, as, as frequently to get some of that information for a story. We try to be very accessible. Um, I think that's something that actually quite a few outlets have reported that the president as well as the administration are more accessible in terms of uh, press interaction than you've seen in previous administrations. That's something that we've really tried to put a, a big focus on, um, certainly in our office. But uh, to pretend like there aren't tensions uh, would be silly. That's but that's not new to this administration. The White House press corps and whatever administration is in power always have tension because we have very different jobs to do. Um, and whether or not sometimes we can work together better than other times, uh, that certainly happens. I do think that there is a greater sense of hostility that I've seen um, in this administration than previous. And I think that you Toward see that. Toward the administration, that, you mean, or in the administration? Uh, towards the administration. And I think you see that reflected in the numbers, like in the coverage. Uh, just last week, there were reports that came out uh, from independent study groups that several of the networks, 93% of the coverage of the administration was negative and 7% positive. If you compare that to the first nine months of the Obama administration, it was 40-60. Uh, so for people to pretend like uh, there isn't a greater sense of hostility towards this administration, uh, I, I think would be to ignore real facts. Olivia, you want to address that for just a minute? <laughs> the, the notion of greater hostility? That yes. Hmm. Oh, man. Um, I mean, I think one of the things I would, I would point out, first of all, is that the, the White House press corps actually is just part of a much larger media ecosystem that also covers the presidency. Okay. You know, when you're writing about legislation, when you're covering the agencies, when you're covering the State Department, the Defense Department, and other places, all of the, that whole, the, the whole package, it does not start and stop with us. It's a huge ecosystem of people. Last year, the WHCA gave an award to someone from the Washington Post who's not in the White House press corps. Um, so it's important to take a broader view, I think, than just the narrow, the narrow yeah, feuding between the, the, the press corps and, and the White House. Um, I think a lot of the fights in previous administrations you probably didn't see spillover, I can guarantee you. I went nose to nose with people who've had Sarah's job before. Um, uh, uh, let me try to think of the, I think I asked one of her predecessors whether they were psycho or just stupid. It's, <laughs> it's. I, I'm glad it's, we haven't gone there yet, Olivia. <laughs> I like the yet. Well, the night's still um, young, right? Uh, so you're saying there's hope. Leaving the window open. So you're saying there's a chance. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the question, the question is whether the, the, that figure that you cite, that Sarah cited, is the result of the, um, extremely different nature of the administration or whether it's a built-in hostility of the administration. And I'm not sure how I weigh the two of those things. You know, the, 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 the use of Twitter, for example, to drive the news cycle, um, there is a fair amount of uh, oh my godding in our, in our, on our side of the business, some of which has been unfortunate. You know, um, some people screaming unprecedented, unbelievable. And uh, you know, some of, the, some of us older folks, um, older folks, um, will say, well, hold on, no, actually, that's not unprecedented. That was Every president has done something like that. I'm thinking of like asking the ambassadors to submit their resignation letters. Um, so this is an unprecedented administration. I don't want to suggest that there are not that this is not a mold-breaking, norm-shattering administration. But I don't know that it's necessarily. Um, I, I don't know that that figure necessarily accurately characterizes the way the press is covering you guys. Let's do, let's do one more. Can, can I? I just echo really quick on that? I think it's oftentimes that it's not even the nature of the question. It's the way that a question is asked. A lot, so often I feel like um, 
certainly the question always comes from a place of like an accusation instead of actually just asking, looking for information. It's more like you're a horrible person, please tell us why. And How do you answer that question? <laughs> Um, they, they actually think I'm a horrible person, so uh, I don't know if that was for the like class. Oh well, I don't know, either way. Uh, I, I do think that the, the, the but that's tone always, but, matters. But, but, but Sarah, excuse me, that has always been the tone at the White House. In the White House press corps, John, you, 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 you know, you've covered other presidents too, right? The, the, the White House is, is a political circus. The State Department is very buttoned down. We talk about policy. The Defense Department, if you're a DOD, it's a, it's a very kind of you know, focused, different sort of questioning. The White House is a political place. The questions always have a political tone. I'm not sure it's I think that there's different. a difference between a political tone and a hateful tone, and those are not the same thing. You think thing. it's a hateful tone? Not all the time, and I'm, and I'm not trying to like overgeneralize the entire like White House press corps, or as Olivier mentioned, there are a lot of reporters that uh, beyond the White House press corps, but absolutely, um, I, I can assure you, I mean, you look at reporters, not just uh, some of their public statements, whether it's through their stories, but you look at some of their Twitter statements, you look at some of their feeds, and you cannot read through a lot of that and not say, this person absolutely hates everything about what we're doing. And it's hard to come to any other conclusion than that when you look at so many of the personal opinions that are injected mm. into a lot of those. And I, I think that's a dangerous place at times. Let, um, let Glenn and then Sarah jump in. It's very important to note that President Trump has made uh, battling the press a centerpiece of his entire political career. He did it on the, during the campaign trail by singling out individual reporters in the press pen. Uh, he has made, it is a centerpiece Your of news his organization entire included. political strategy. And that is, rather than the, I disagree profoundly with Sarah on this, nobody hates anyone. I mean, the, I think the thing that- I don't. The thing that has, the thing that has, uh, I can't, actually I can't speak for everybody. <laughs> 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 I, can only, exactly. I, can only, I can only speak for my, for my uh, mellow self. The, um, <laughs> the, 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 I, I, the president made uh, Steve Bannon like the second. I, I don't remember the timing of this. You know, said essentially what the president calls the enemy of the American people. Steve Bannon, had, what did he call us? The opposition party. Come on, we need. Th this is a president who has a political strategy. Again, we know this because we have interviewed all of his political strategists. Um, because of his high negative uh, ratings, which were present during the campaign, north of fifty percent, unprecedented numbers for a major party candidate. His tactic. Uh, strategy, actually, as a presidential candidate, was to raise the negative of his opponent, which is entirely intuitive and totally smart. And by the way, genius worked. He's president of the United States. He needs an opponent. This is this is uh, this is a a politician who does not do particularly well standing alone on center stage. He's somebody who performs best as a politician and as a political entity with an, with opposition. And in the absence of uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton or who, whoever next is gonna come up against him, he chooses opponents. Mitch McConnell at the moment is a target. He requires that because that is what his political career is premised on. And the, and the political press is his central omnipresent opponent. More than anything else, I think, and you saw that with the first appearance Sean Spicer made in public. <laughs> it was not to come out and answer questions. It was to harangue us about a fact, making a factual error at maximum decibel. <laughs> not giving anyone a chance to ask him questions. Uh, and, and I think that was at the behest of the President of the United States. And I think that tells you straight out. It, this really is not that hard, guys. Like, it tells you straight out. Just take Sean at his initial word. Uh, I think in, in, in Sarah's, uh, in praise of Sarah and the way that she has handled the briefing room, I give her incredibly high marks for lowering the temperature and engendering uh, an environment of mutual respect. I also think Hope Hicks. The communications director has also played a really productive role with regard to that. But I think this is, again, emanating from the president's political strategy and his attitude towards the press. Sarah, you're our political scientist. Take a step back. And, uh, and so I'm my only experience with the briefing room is from Saturday Night Live. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not, not so then Glenn. Right? But, but what <laughs> you do know a lot about is the, the reality is much better. Than it's polarized it's public. Better. You're welcome any time <laughs> to get a real so, view. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear here the stakes are huge. 
right? The president is enormously powerful in terms of the US global position in the world and for individual lives in the United States. He can be a force for good and he can be a force for bad in both arenas. And so it makes sense that there's this type of conflict going on and we expect the press to play that role of accountability. Right, I think the, the, that's, I can't speak to the kind of harshness of the, the debate that goes on on a daily basis, but someone has to ask Does those Does this reflect questions. the polarization that you see in the broader public when you study the public? Well, I don't, I don't read the, the press as being partisan on one side or the other, so I don't think of it as that type of polarization. Uh, but it's just the stakes are huge because there's such disagreement about what, what policy, what, what is even a problem and what the, what the outcomes are, what the solutions are. And that was a, you can't, it was an intensely polarizing, in that sense, uh, election. Uh, a lot of big claims made uh, and a lot of promises made. And I think it's the role of the press to try to hold the White House accountable uh, for what progress is, is, is being made. You know, the, the president, as Glenn says, has effectively used the press as a foil, as an opponent of the opposition party, whatever you want to say. But also, also he, he has tapped in, in, in doing that. Uh, to a very deep well of resentment among many people in this country that they do believe that the press is biased against all Republicans, that if you're a, a liberal, everything you say is truth, and if you're a Republican, everything you say is a lie. I remember <clears throat> when I was with CBS years ago at, I think it was George Bush's second inauguration in 2004, Trent Locke came up to me and as a representative of CBS at the time, and he said, you people don't know what's going on in my part of America. You tell what's going on in the two coasts and you ignore the center part of the country. And one of these days, that, that attitude is going to come home to roost. And it took a while, it did. but it came home to roost in 2016 because I went to so many campaign events in so many little towns and big towns across America. And when President Trump singled out the media, he had the entire room with him. And it got to the point where I became worried that perhaps some people were going to become violent against members of the press, which is just something that should never happen in this country. We see that in dictatorships. We see that in autocracies, in places of the world that are very, very dark corners. And that should never happen in the United States of America. And I think some, a couple of times, Sarah, I, th I think, you know, with all due respect, he went too far mm. in what he did. But he does reflect a very deep-seated resentment among millions of people in this country for the press. Um, in a couple of minutes, we are going to move to the question and answer section of tonight. Um, I wanted to circle back to an answer I st started to give before you panned me earlier, uh, which was the question was um, <clears throat> whether things had changed. And I, I think the temperature that you bring to the debate certainly has changed since the opening months of the administration but that the uh, vim and vigor with which President Trump um, continues to often uh, greet me in the morning by Twitter um, has not. Personally, I mean. It's it feels <laughs> personal, so it's, it's, it has intensified, uh, or at least remained steady. And I think for many of us, um, we're constantly weighing whether or not to respond Right, talk about that, write about it. Is, it. is it bait, is it a distraction, or is it important to kind of defend the principles of what we do? And, um, you know, for me, I've been a journalist for a quarter of a century. I, wow. I work, I know, it's funny because I'm only 30, so I don't know how that happened, but. Um, Say 25 years, it sounds <laughs> less. Uh, I, I work really hard at getting it right and, uh, and being fair and listening to all sides of the story. And nobody likes to be attacked when they, when they care a lot about being perceived as, as, as being fair and open-minded and, and working hard and being factual. Um, my, uh, my father, who's gone now, uh, escaped from Bulgaria, from a communist country. And uh, when I was growing up, the debates around the dinner table were always about criticizing government and questioning authority, no matter which party the president and, and the government or the Congress was controlled by, and that one of the great liberties of being an American is to question anybody who's in power. And that was kind of just a, a foundational building block of why I became a journalist and, and I think why many of us care so much about our craft. And I, I think many of us worry that um, because there is some of this underlying distrust about the media, um, that people don't know that about us. And, and 
uh, it's true that past presidents have, we've always jousted behind the scenes, um, but in, in public the message has almost always been about, even though I hate these guys, what they do is really important and it's a great part of America. And because we don't hear that as much, I, I think we worry about um, some of the long-term costs of this. I, I think that goes both ways, though. I think that there is certainly, um, I've never been attacked more, questioned more. Uh, I mean, I was called a liar by a major network in an official statement. Um, I've been called outrageous things on air, and it goes unquestioned. There's no pushback. And, and that's time and time again to administration officials, the president. So I think that there has to be a, a you know, an appreciation too for our side that we're working hard, that we're putting in hours, we're doing the very best we can to represent the administration as well. And I, and I think that's often overlooked. Does the president appreciate the right and the need to question authority? Absolutely. I does think he, that does he want to, Does he want to be questioned? Yeah, I think Does that you want to be challenged. I think it's an important part of democracy, but I also think that with that freedom comes a great deal of responsibility and I think that you have to have a high level of responsibility to report accurate information. Um, and I think that that is not done all the time. I've literally had conversations where I've been in a room in a meeting that included five people. I talked to all four other people just to make sure I didn't miss something. I go back to the reporter. I tell them, guys, I was in the room. This didn't happen. I talked to the other four people that were in the room. We all agree that nothing even similar to this took place. And they're like, I'm sorry, I've got a source outside of the White House, but close to the White House, so I'm going to run with it. We can't compete against that. And I think that there's a real disservice um, on, on both sides. And we've actually, you know, we had a meeting today in our office to do um, push for things that come from the administration and particularly from the press office to be on the record because I think it's hard for us to argue that we want you guys to have on record sources if we're not going on the record. Now there's sometimes there's gonna be process stuff that isn't necessarily an on the record, but if, it, if it's uh, particularly um, a policy initiative and things like that, that should be on the record so you're for saying us. There will be more on the record. For yeah. And, and, and that's something that we've tried, I think, to do um, with some success over the last couple of months, uh, is working more to do on the record, certainly on camera briefings to allow that uh, sense of access and sense of transparency so that you have that. But I think that goes both ways. And I don't think that we can be asked to constantly uh, be out in the open, be transparent, and to do something uh, so forward-leaning and always on the record when we're constantly having to compete with uh, anonymous sources that weren't in the room, that aren't part of the process, and can frankly make up anything in the world they want to uh, because we can't prove a negative. And so if we have to compete with that constantly, I think that is a really difficult situation, and I think it's a very a big disservice to the American people that there aren't more credible sourcing and I think some of the bigger outlets it's less of a problem but now anybody with a you know computer can be a journalist and sure. um, it, you're constantly kind of having to juggle uh, the differences of real journalism and not but I, I do think that the anonymous sourcing is a really big problem and something that as much as we can move away from we should. April why don't you make a point and then we're going to turn to the floor. for Yeah I just want to ask uh, make a point and ask a question really fast. The late Helen Thomas said everything comes to the White House from water peace and everything in between. And I want to go back to a question, uh, comment that you made about people making jabs or saying things. It's, it's more their personal feelings. When we ask questions of you, and of course there are people there who kind of ask questions towards your base. There are other people who ask questions towards the other side. Then there are people who just ask questions. When you look at that room, how do you determine which one is a negative, which one is a positive, and which one should I call on? I, I, don't, I don't look at the room uh, as negatives and positives. Uh, so I think that's the wrong way to view the room. I look at the room as kind of an open book. I try to make my way around the room. I have people that come up to 
my office and say, hey, you don't call on people on the left side of the room. So the next day I try to focus on the left side of the room. Hey, you don't call on people in the back of the room. So I try to you know, make my way around uh, a mix of TV versus print versus radio uh, versus online and try to give a mix of you know, more left-leaning, more right-leaning publications. Uh, I, I, I don't think that anyone can say I don't take tough questions. I call on uh, a mix of everyone. I, again, I don't look at the room as negatives and positives, but as uh, kind of an open floor space to, you know, everything is fair game. And I do the very best job I can to call on a variety of people and make sure that I give fair and updated and accurate information as, as much as I can. Who, who do you go to when you're looking for an escape hatch? You, you, I mean, you can guess. John <laughs> Roberts, John <laughs> Roberts. No, it's definitely not John <laughs> We don't want to name names here. No, I'm not going to. I say okay. Nobody's watching. Say Dana, Dana Perino. <laughs> go ahead. Dana Whisper Perino used to say, whenever she got trapped, she'd go to somebody who she knew would ask about the WTO. <laughs> that's that's only kind of funny because, as in my former iteration as the White House correspondent for Agence France Presse, I was one of the people <laughs> the that Ari funny. Fleischer would go to when he got in the trouble on, on a domestic story. He'd look around the room, and if Goyle wasn't around, <laughs> oh, uh, he's calling names. He would, they're calling names. He, calling would, names. he would point to me because he was going to get an Iran story, or he was going to get a question about the European Union, or he was going to get a question about U.S.-Japan relations. Or, so he knew he could get out, out out of trouble on a domestic story by going to me. So I feel kind of keenly in <laughs> my brethren in the uh, in the sideline community. <laughs> so I think we should come to the floor now. We promised that, and um, we'll, uh, we, we've got a few hands up already. I think we've got mics moving around. Okay, There's a lot of them. Why don't Why don't we come right down here? Why don't you move out to the um, to the aisle? Yeah, and. You hang on to the mic for him. No, right? He's standing. All right. Before, before let me you ask let me ask question. you. A, yeah. a, I was going to say, just let me ask you a favor. Keep your questions to questions, not speeches. Keep them as short as you can, and we will not have everybody answer everything and move it around here so we can get to as many of these things as possible. If you're comfortable introducing yourself, please do. That'd be great. And if you have a question for a specific panelist. Please ask it specifically so it Sarah. doesn't turn into a free for all. Take it, take it away, Sarah. And, and if yes. you want to ask anybody to my left or right, <laughs> okay. Sarah, Sarah. Thank you so much. My name is Teodor Mihailescu. I'm a visiting scholar at Tens MPA. I work on US presidential speech writing. Uh, in the last 30 years, the White House has developed an institutionalist process that allows different departments to have a say in and check for accuracy the statement that US president makes. And that's because every word that the president speaks has an impact all over the world. And it's also because this, these feedback loops allow the different departments within the White House to actually resolve any outstanding policy issues before the public statements are made. So what is your question? Uh, so my question. Um, President Trump seems to be circumventing this mechanism a bit through his tweets. So my question to the press secretary is, how should foreign governments and institutional partners and even the wider public relate to President Trump's tweets? Are they public statements that the entire administration can stand behind or are they personal views of the individual Donald Trump? And the question for the other members of the panel is, how do you relate to President Trump's tweets? Is it one or the other? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, they're public statements by the president. I think that um, it's an important tool that he has uh, the ability to speak directly to the American people. Uh, you don't always have to like it or agree with it, but I think that there is something uh, really unique about this president in the fact that he does talk directly to the American people. It doesn't come through a filter uh, of any of these individuals or even myself, but it's a direct line of communication and it's a way for him to uh, tell America and the rest of the world exactly where he is on a particular issue or topic at any given moment. And I, I think that's something that frankly, people should be celebrating the idea that you have someone who is so candid and authentic, because I think that's one of the reasons he became president. They wanted somebody who wasn't scripted every single minute of the day and who wasn't a, a programmed robot, but somebody that was very candid, very authentic, and would buck the system. And you get that in President Trump. And I think that's one of the ways that he does that. His yeah. tweets are official. I use them in my news stories. 
So yeah. there's certainly positive aspects to the tweets that you just said. There's a downside if you're a House or Senate Republican trying to negotiate, say, tax <laughs> policy, right? There's a mantra on the Hill, nothing's agreed to until everything's agreed to. Go behind closed doors if you have to, negotiate a complex deal, and then release it, right? Because otherwise people will start picking at the different pieces once they hear, oh, he's going to do this, he's going to do this. By tweeting about the 401k, he took that off the agenda, right? Negotiators might have included that particular tax provision, but it upended the ability to, to maneuver. So there's a downside. There's an upside, for sure, but there's a policy consequence. In my hunch, is that, that hurts uh, negotiators on the tax bill. But, it, but I think it does offer that extra layer of transparency, which I think America appreciates a lot more than closed-door uh, meetings. They know exactly where the president is, and I think that certainly outweighs the negative on that front. But the challenge is, the phrase that Sarah used, which is at any given moment, right? Because on Monday, he might say China is not being helpful at all in North Korea, and on Tuesday, he might say they've been great and wonderful and cooperative. And so one of the challenges for reporters is tracking those kinds of statements. You know, the, the, an old guitar soloist who was described as having a bumblebee in a jar, and you open the jar, and the bumblebee <laughs> goes around. And so there are some weeks where you're just you're seeing these 180-degree shifts, or in some cases, 360-degree shifts, by the president on Twitter. And those are very hard for us to sort of wrap our brains around and report. Because if you're, you know, Tuesday he's angry with China, Wednesday he's fine. What, how, how do you process that as a reporter? We have not never had a minute to minute uh, a bead onto a president's consciousness or mood or instinct the way we have now. That is certainly. Uh, historic development. Let's take a question from this side of the room, if we can. Uh, Learning from Sarah. See, it's not as easy as it looks, is it? Yeah, <laughs> that's not this. We have a, a lot of options. OK, uh, second row, woman. Yes, stand. <laughs> woman. <laughs> she has to introduce herself. <laughs> I know. You woman, stand. <laughs> Hi, I opened my phone. Hold on. Um, I'm Katie Abagazale. I'm a student at GW. Um, so there's a continuing notion that President Trump has more sensational headlines overshadow other news, such as the NFL debacle um, overshadowing Hurricane Maria and North Korea. Um, so as members of the press, how do you address this claim and how do you pick the stories to cover? Okay, great. We just cover it all. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the only way to do it. When you're drinking from a fire hose, you, you, get a, you get a very big mop and a very big sponge, and you try to digest it all. Uh, clearly, though, this is a president who has a background in reality television. He is a very controversial figure and has been for his entire life. And so the controversies do tend to rise to the surface a, a little bit. And, and I took special note the other day uh, when I was the pool correspondent uh, for the Oval Office pool spray with Governor Rosseo of Puerto Rico. The president talked for 35 minutes, yes. which I think was a record-setting Oval Office pool spray. And the poor cameraman was going like this by the end of it. <laughs> but he really wanted to talk about Puerto Rico. And I think the reason why he wanted to talk about Puerto Rico, because there was some sensitivities on the part of the president that maybe he needed to get the story out there a little more uh, against the opposition of how he believes that this administration has responded to Puerto Rico. So being a person born, forged in the crucible of controversy, the controversies are always going to rise to the surface, unless they're war with North Korea, which might possibly trump the NFL. Yes, but uh, it's, it's just the heat is what rises, you know, heat rises, and that's the way it is he, with this guy. He loves the NFL story. It's great. He's told people, we've reported, other people report it, that it's good, it's good base politics. It's also just intuitively what mm -hmm. he's into. He tried to own an NFL franchise. He had a USFL franchise. It's very much on his mind. And it's part of like, uh, it's, it's part of sort of the cultural mil milieu in which he exists. So it, with, as with a lot of things, and Sarah can totally talk about this too, is w w with the president, it, it typically works on four or five different levels. It doesn't tend to do anything for one particular reason. It tends to be a combination of the political, uh, the personal, and what's in the news at the moment. Not to be, not to be Debbie Downer here, <laughs> but there's, there's a policy consequence for his legislative agenda, I think, and that's part of the difficulty for Republicans in advancing it. It's tough to stick to message. And Rex Tillerson, when, for instance, you, know, you get undercut in negotiations with mm -hmm. the Chinese and the North Koreans. I, th I think, too, there's an obsession uh, with the media. They'd far more rather talk about They They sit up here, and, and uh, no offense to any of you guys, but you act like you'd love to talk about policy. You have the platform. You're very uh, 
able to steer the conversation to more substantive policy conversation, to talk about legislative things. There are a lot of big things that have taken place in the administration that have gotten virtually zero coverage. When it comes to the economy, the stock market is, is at an all-time high. Unemplo unemployment at a 16-year low. ISIS on the run. The Supreme Court justice nomination. There are some major things. Deregulation at an unprecedented rate. Over uh, nearly a thousand regulations that have cut back. That have allowed a lot of the companies that are creating jobs, the, the growth that has taken place, that doesn't get talked about. Well, and if you look at the polling, too, of what Americans actually care <laughs> about, it is economy, it is jobs, it is national security. If you look at what the media covers, it is palace intrigue. It's who likes who today. It's whether this person is friends with this person. It's very rarely on the substantive policy issue, particularly more so on the TV front, which drives a lot of the other coverage uh, that other outlets write about. And so I, I think it's great for us to act like it's all driven by the White House's inability to push things. We're getting a lot of things done. We're making a lot of progress. But frankly, I don't think the media wants well, to talk about it very Sarah, often. Sarah, on April 6, uh, 2017, I remember that because it was my birthday. <laughs> Happy sat, belated birthday. Thank you very much. I sat in the Oval Office. <laughs> better, better late than never. That's really nice. Thank you. I sat in the Oval Office with the President and my colleague Maggie Haberman. And we mm. asked the president some serious questions about infrastructure, and he immediately turned the conversation to Bill O'Reilly. And then he went on to Susan Rice talking about uh, Susan Rice talking about unmasking. It, we really had to chase him around to, in terms of the conversation, to bring it back to infrastructure. He didn't want to talk about infrastructure, and he didn't have a lot of specifics when we pressed him on specifics. So. I wasn't part of that meeting, so I'm not going <laughs> to. But, but I, I'm not going to comment on that. But if yeah. you look at the activity of the White House day to day, um, particularly, I mean, today you have a foreign leader visit, you have a Medal of Honor uh, award ceremony, and those things got far less coverage just today alone. That and those are big things. But Sarah, those that's are major moments. That, that, that's always the case. That's no, always, and, and, and I'm not uh, saying so, that no, it's so, different. So the, the question really is, the president has the bully pulpit. The president, through the message discipline that Sarah's talking about and others have talked about, has the capacity to, to, to set the agenda, to set the frame of a story. And so it, it doesn't it go both ways? I mean, isn't it also something that you and your boss should be mindful of? If you want more policy coverage, you want more substantive coverage, substance coverage, you can, you can contribute to that. And I think we do every single day uh, th through speeches, uh, through events at the White House, through the activity that we're doing. Uh, but Sarah, but let me ask you this. I mean, today was great. I mean, typically the, you know, the medal ceremony would be like one of the highest pieces. But when you have a president who goes out on Twitter and refutes what a gold star widow says, that's news. And it's unfortunate that the nation is gripped in that, but that's news. I think that whole process is, frankly, unfortunate. I think it um, is appalling that we have focused more on the <clears throat> process instead of the people. Uh, I think it is a real sad moment when it is we're sad. focused far more on the process of what time a call was placed versus the fact that there was loss of military uh, soldiers and that there were individuals that were killed in action. We should be talking about the heroes. We should be talking about their lives. And that hasn't been the focus. But their congressional it's all leaders now calling for about... an apology. Will there be an apology? I'm sorry? Their congressional leaders like Congressman Elijah Cummings, the um, African American, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, um, the, the women of the Congressional Black Caucus are calling for an apology from the Chief of Staff, General Kelly. Will there be an apology? I don't think that General Kelly uh, was wrong, and therefore I don't think he should offer an apology. So where did he get that information then? He was there, um, and this wasn't, everyone wants to narrow this down to a nine minute speech. This was uh, something that took place over the course of the day. And um, you have two different accounts. And um, I, I think General Kelly gave one of the most I'm talking about when he let's, let's raw lie. and emotional uh, accounts that anyone could give. And I think he has a lot of credibility on this topic uh, and a lot of credibility in general, given the life of service that he has lived. And I take him at his word, and I don't have anything further to add beyond that. But it was about the discrediting of Wilson. That's what they are looking for an apology for. 
And again, I think that the account that he's given reflects what he saw that day. And I, I think he has, again, um, the highest level of integrity. And I am, again, I support him in uh, his account of that interaction and what he saw and how he uh, felt and what he t saw take place that day. Let's go back to another uh, question from the floor. Let's come back to this side and we'll go over <clears throat> there. Yeah. There. Can we, can you move to the mic or can the mic move to you? Really? And again, I'm going to ask you and it's running a little late. I'll tell you what, we've, we've had an amazing conversation. Let's go for another 10 minutes or so. If that's all right, is that okay? Get you home to your Maybe kids? Maybe five minutes or so. <laughs> we'll call it seven. It's yeah. a really early morning. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. My name is Stephen Kelly. I'm a SMPA student. Um, I have a question for the press secretary. Um, you say that you support the press's role in challenging and critiquing the president. Um, what is a critique of the president or his administration that someone in the press has leveled that you feel has been valid or fair? Uh, you know, I think certainly um, on the front end of the administration, um, we could have done a better job of providing uh, information to the press. And I think some of that was uh, a little bit of a learning curve. I have the advantage of being second in the administration in this position. And so I had the opportunity to learn a lot of different things. But I certainly think that we could have done a better job of information flow to help impact the stories uh, that would reflect the administration position a lot better if we had been more uh, forthcoming on the front end. I think a lot of that was just kind of a procedure process and us learning some of that um, kind of on the job training a little bit on the front end. But I certainly think that's somewhere where we could have done a better job, particularly in relation to um, the press and the media. That's where I feel most comfortable talking about where critiques might be fair. OK, if, if we might be able to get two, we can definitely get one more. Uh, let's go to the back gentleman over there. Yep, you who just turned your head backwards. Yeah. <laughs> right, Mike is coming. Don't make her fall. I think you guys purposely put yeah. people in the middle of the row <laughs> yeah, so that uh, <laughs> they have to run around, make it a little harder. I'd like to ask about uh, Anthony Scaramucci, about why. <laughs> Okay, last question. Huh? About uh, what sort of <laughs> decisions were made in order to hire Anthony Scaramucci and to allow him to give, uh, or direct him to give his interview with, I believe, the New York Times. Uh, New, York. New, Yorker. New Yorker. New Yorker. Yeah. New Yorker. I wish. Sorry. <laughs> I, every night, man, I go to sleep. I every go, night. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Mooch was mine. <laughs> So TMI, Brian Glenn. Lizza just took him away. TMI, Glenn, come on, man. <laughs> right in there. Well, that was a nice insight into Glenn's life there. <laughs> <laughs> or, or lack of it. Uh, now, now you in, know how to get him. <laughs> in, in terms of the hiring process, uh, I wouldn't have, I can't speak to that. That would have not been something I would have been a part of. Uh, in terms of the interview, that was a decision he made. Um, and uh, you would have to ask him uh, how he feels about the decision to do that. Um, but Will you be uh, giving interviews like that? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I don't know if that answers your question. It's not a lot of information, but um, that was a decision he made to do that interview, and um, you'd have to ask him for any further detail on it. OK, so we are going to do one more. Last question. Not that it wasn't an amazing question. Um, <laughs> Uh, gentleman here. Yes. Yes, you. <laughs> Hurl the microphone. Give, give him the microphone. Hurl it. Go long. <laughs> Run! Oh, he's running. Go, no, go! Oh, he's coming. Oh. Well, good evening. Uh, first off, I'll thank you all of you for spending a great evening with all of us in one of the best universities in this world, the George Washington <laughs> University. <laughs> great. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Uh, I, I think that counts as a statement. I, was, yeah, I, I think it may have been a plant. But. No, 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 but don't stop now. Okay. No. My name is Henry Huang, and since it's kind of, I'm a second year student in Elliott School studying international affairs. Since it's kind of running late, so I'll try to keep my question as short and sweet as possible. My question is regarding President Trump's tweet, which has stirred up a lot of discussion, i.e. the famous misspelling, Kav Fei Fei. Oh, no. <laughs> um, now, we all know that 
White House press briefing travels slower and spreads slower than the tweet than, than, than President Trump's Twitter. So my question is, how does your job have changed through this year in order to respond more precisely, more accurately towards Trump's tweet when it comes to White House briefing? Thank you. I think that was actually a question for you guys. I know. I'm off the hook for the last. So the, so the question, if we've got it right, is uh, how ha have the president's Twitter instincts and other instincts changed the way we do our job, right? Thankfully, I'm on the hour. I'm on. I'm on the air every hour, so I, I'm frequently updating. Um, you know what? What you've got to do is every. I've got four different alerts for when he tweets, so that I'm covered on every front to make sure that I I don't miss it. And as soon as he tweets. We sent out a blast to the network to show what he has tweeted, but everybody else is getting it on their iPhones anyways. And it's, it's kind of like a running commentary almost, you know, particularly in the sometimes changeable way that he goes about his, his tweets and you know, the topics that he flips back and forth to. So um, we just have to, we stay on top of it and we just get it on the air almost as soon as it gets out. Now, of course, if there's something that kind of pops out that we go, what's that all about? Then we make the call to Sarah to get some confirmation here of what the president's What is Kafefe, about. right? Exactly like that. Yeah. Exactly. Like what is Kafefe? He, he, he gave a, a fascinating interview just the other day on your network, right? Yes. On your business network. Talking, saying, yeah, and he, said, and he it, said, I wouldn't be president if, you know, I might not be he, president. He also I, said he something. Said, he also, I watch it and I tweet right then. He, he also said something that was interesting, too. Remember, the, who saw the movie Broadcast News? Remember when Albert Brooks is talking about uh, the leadership qualities of Muammar Gaddafi and he picks up the phone when William Hurt is on the air and he says, blah, 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 blah. And William Hurt says it right back. And he says, I say it in here and it comes out there. The president looks at Twitter in very much the same way. He said, for him, it's like a typewriter. I type it on my, my smartphone or whatever he uses to tweet. And the next thing he knows, it's on television. So it's his way of using a typewriter almost to get whatever he wants on the air in almost real time. What do you do at the New York Times online or what do you do with, with his tweets? Do you report them in real time? Are you reporting differently? How do you at Yahoo, which is a digital news platform, handle tweets that are coming literally at any hour of the day or night? It's evolved. I think early on, I remember getting in trouble. I will, I will share this detail. I remember getting <laughs> in trouble because I was on TV when I was on duty. I was actually on air when he tweeted something, and I actually wrote the story while I was on air, but I still, there was a sense of incredible urgency early on that absolutely everything he tweeted. Everything tweeted was. And I think what's, got, what's happened now, and I think it's actually quite healthy, and, and you hear this from diplomats too about foreign leaders. They tend to absorb things, and I think it's being much more released into, time released into the bloodstream. So even if he does it in, in real time, I think people are saying now, wait a second, what does this mean? How is this play in with what he said before, and should we take it seriously? Yeah, it's the reassertion of news judgment, right? Yeah. It's basically outlets that have come to sort of get used to this fast-paced, constantly moving uh, news from the president. Um, I do think it's notable that, I, I don't know about any of you guys, I have never written a story off an at POTUS tweet. They're all from at real Donald Trump, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know across the media. I don't know that anyone. Want to explain the, di the distinction? Yeah. So at POTUS is the official presidential Twitter account, and at real Donald Trump is what the president's really thinking. And it's <laughs> there. It, it's it's funny to me to see that because it, we used to get mad when you know the Obama folks announced stuff on Twitter, and that seems like a, a quaint time, almost as quaint. And John will remember this, almost as quaint as when we were all in a tizzy because President George W. Bush walked out of the Rose Garden holding Bernie Goldberg's bias under his arm. And that was considered <laughs> you know, an incredible attack on the, uh, on, on the fourth estate. Uh, reassertion of news judgment has been very important. Does this fit into a, a story we currently have? And therefore, do we add you know, later the president, and I love this phrase, took to Twitter to, uh, to say X. Um, I do have, on some issues, right of first refusal. So on North Korea stuff um, and foreign policy in general, I can sort of you know, come in and say, don't, or I will or go ahead. Sarah, Sarah Binder, can I turn to you? You know, thinking of this, again, as a political scientist, do these things that you're hearing, how does this change political discourse, the way political discourse has taken place, and, and, the, and the power of the bully pulpit, which you know well and have studied? Well, I think one thing, so my vantage is always from the Hill, right? One thing we always say is there are 535 members, they can't possibly coordinate, right? And they look to the White House for a single message. 
So the tweets kind of fragments, fragments attention. Mm -hmm. I think that's different than what we're used to coming from a, from a White House. Yeah, um, right. Tweets can be good for discourse, and they can be bad for discourse. So I think it's pretty, uh, pretty widespread effect. One, one of the differences in, in recent months, I guess, has been that in the initial going, because this is all so new, literally every tweet that he issued made it on the air in some form. Now it's only the ones that are like really that, that get on the air now. And there are still a lot of those. I think as we wrap up, we would uh, like to try to give Sarah um, some parting words. Uh, I just first quickly want to go back to um, the issue that Olivia raises about at POTUS versus at real Donald Trump. And it, and it raises a question or a theme that we're going to need a whole other panel to talk about, um, which is are some of the changes that we've seen in these past nine months um, permanent changes to the political landscape, what it means to be president, the interaction of the president with the public and the press uh, forever? Is the landscape change in American politics? Or are some of these specific to Donald Trump, or to Donald Trump term one, or to Donald Trump year one? And that, I think, number one, remains to be seen. And number two probably is a whole other panel. Uh, the WHCA uh, always likes to try to do educational panels throughout the year. This year, we are going to be making an effort to do uh, more than normal and to try to get out to some other parts of the country. So we hope, whether you're in this room or watching on TV or live stream, that you will uh, stay in touch with us. After we go home tonight, we all still have email, and we really would. And Twitter. And Twitter, and Twitter, and Twitter, and would, not, lo and would love not, to hear from guy. you. Well, you Twitter so he will. says. Dormant. Just, you're just <laughs> taking a break for now. Uh, but anyhow, and we, we do really very much want to thank you for your time and, and give you the floor for a couple minutes. Um, I won't even take a couple minutes. I just want to say thank you for uh, inviting me, allowing me to come, and certainly for, I think, a um, very uh, open and positive back and forth. And so I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, answer questions. And uh, I think that it means, since I took questions from most of the panel, that I don't have to take questions from them tomorrow. <laughs> Great, that means you're not going to be no, calling No, no, no. <laughs> guys, you're out of luck. Good luck. Panel Raise my hand. Raise my hand. You have to talk to those anonymous sources. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> right. in, in, all, in all seriousness, I really do appreciate the opportunity. And certainly, um, I think the opportunity that you guys don't get to see, but that the back and forth that we have on the daily basis with uh, not just the folks up here, but I see quite a few other uh, White House reporters in the room. Um, and I do think that that is an important relationship and one that I hope that we can continue uh, to improve and look for better ways for both of us to do our jobs, which I think is to get information to the American people. Uh, and that's to get accurate and um, informative information to the American people. And I think the more that we can work together to do that, I think the better off we're all going to be. And so, again, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, look forward to continuing to, to do this more and certainly uh, taking more questions from these guys. Well, I, I, I hope you will come out. I would like to thank the White House Correspondents Association and all the folks up on stage. Uh, you work monstrously long days. I know you're going, to, you're going to be back super early in the morning, and you actually have a family to get back to tonight. Uh, but I think that conversations like this are really important, and this is an unusual one, because usually you're across the podium from one another. Uh, and for us to have an opportunity to engage the conversation about how this works, about some of the issues, for you to hear uh, some of the concerns expressed by people here, as you do all the time, and take some of the questions from the floor is, is gigantically important. We at at, at this university and with our students and with our faculty who are doing the research and others, um, try very hard to understand this process. Uh, there's a lot of talking about the First Amendment and what it means. We study it here, and we study it here because it is a pillar, a cornerstone of what we are all about. You are, all of you, on that front row. You are shaping uh, history. And I think that uh, we all very much appreciate the conversation here. I think we also look to you to have um, this respectful but adversarial relationship mm -hmm. with, with one another. The questioning of authority that you talked about is what this is all about. Holding you to account is their job, and you should hold them to account. We should be held to account for what we, as in journalism, do and write and get right and get wrong. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, John, to your point, that the public has so little confidence in the media right now because they don't see that level of accountability as a two-way street. So a very healthy thing. 
Many thanks to all of you for being here this evening. Thanks to our audience on C-SPAN and our live stream audience for joining us. And again, thank you so much thank you. for your time and being so generous with what is your most precious commodity, which is your time. So thanks. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.